Thank you. Enjoy your lunch. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, my name is Tim Lorden. For those who do not know me, I am the Executive Director of the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee. Um, this is the inaugural State of the Mobile Net Conference. A lot of you are familiar maybe with uh, the State of the Net uh, that we have in January and the State of the Net West, which will be in August, uh, August 5th of this year in Santa Clara, uh, California. Um, I wanted to thank, this is our first time exploring mobile issues in such a large setting. We've done congressional briefings on mobile privacy, mobile spectrum for years in the Capitol building through our traditional congressional briefing process. But this is the first time we've ever really kind of looked at, looked at it from a variety of different disciplines. And we're very excited about it. I uh, wanted to thank all of our sponsors and all the support from everybody who's helped us with the intellectual capital to put this all together. CTIA, Verizon, Microsoft, AT&T. Um, uh, and I've left somebody else out, and, so, and I apologize, T-Mobile, everybody's been fantastic in helping us, helping us put this all together. Nokia, and I forgot about Google, I apologize. Um, one thing I'd like to do is, is apologize, what we're going to do is uh, uh, introductory remarks, uh, a keynote, then we'll go into a general session uh, explaining what, what is the mobile net, which I'm actually curious about. We'll then break into two breakout sessions, which are just on the hall here in Columbia A and B. Uh, they're concurrent, um, two different sets of them. And then we'll finish up um, with one general session on policy framework facing the mobile net. Um, one thing I'd, I really would, I also need to say is Anish Chopra, who was confirmed to speak today, they <laughs> killed me. They, he's now the, nominated as the federal CTO. Um, I don't know if you had anything to do with this, Susan, but it's really killing me today. Um, he is not able to make comments until his, his confirmation hearing before the Senate, but we wish him well for his confirmation hearing. So I apologize. Anish will not be with us today. Um, on on more, more sober news, um, many, most of you perhaps do not know um, one of the founders of my organization, uh, in, in which launched the Congressional Internet Caucus and its advisory committee um, over 13 years ago, uh, Judith Krug um, from the American Library, American Library Association, uh, passed away about a week and a half ago. Uh, she was the co-chair of my board of directors. She was the driving force behind this organization, and she is responsible. She's one of the one of the few people responsible f mostly for everything that you see and everything that we do. Um, she created the, the Freedom to Read Foundation and she championed um, intellectual freedom um, and free speech uh, during her tenure at the American Library Association. She will be sorely missed. She also created um, Banned Book Week uh, at the American Library Association uh, to promote intellectual freedom and, and again, uh, we will miss her. and. Um, uh, her obituary and a New York Times editorial is available on our website at neted.org. So, um, but, uh, so, um, <laughs> tough segue to Susan Crawford, uh, who, who did share the misfortune of actually sharing kind of office space with me for about a year, uh, about six years ago, and listening to my rants and raves on a daily basis. Uh, Susan is now um, special, special Assistant to the President for Science, Technology, and Innovation Policy. She also serves as a member of the National Economic uh, Council. Uh, she's on leave from Michigan State uh, Law School. And from, <laughs> from 2005 to 2008, served um, on the ICANN board, which is um, as difficult as sitting next to me in the office, I would imagine. And she's also uh, uh, formerly with uh, Wilmer Cutler Pickering, which is now Wilmer Hale. She was a former partner. But we are pleased to have her with us today to make some opening remarks. And congratulations, Susan, on the appointment. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks to Tim Lord and his terrific crew, these bipartisan thoughtful conferences are really central to this ecosystem, these people who are involved with telecom and internet and information policy. And it's Tim who pulls it all together, because this ecosystem is thriving, and it needs to talk to itself in its self-organizing way. So I'm very grateful to be here. I'm also very grateful to be serving as a member of the Obama administration. Uh, this is a president who deeply understands technology. This is the first president with a computer on his desk and a Blackberry that he fiercely held onto in his pocket. He, you know, he's not the first president to figure out how to use technology to diminish distance. FDR did it with the radio chats and President Obama is doing it with podcasts and digital town halls. 
uh, none of us will forget the tweet by which Biden was announced. And I myself have met the staffer who drafted that tweet. So that was a big, a big moment. And I wish I could convey to you exactly what it's like to be in the White House right now. Uh, there was a joke around the time of the transition, sort of a summer camp for workaholics. Um, it's not quite like that, but uh, there are uh, lots of extraordinarily compassionate and intelligent and in focused people, men and women, striding purposefully through the halls. Um, President Obama seems to have hired a, a lot of multitaskers. They're making good judgments every two or three minutes and typing briskly on their Blackberries. Because I do think it's very important that President Obama held on to that Blackberry. Uh, this is a, the beginning. I don't, you know, it's too, too much to say we're right at the beginning, but we're in the very early stages of a hugely transformative moment for mobile technology. Um, as you know, because you came to lunch, mobile communication is already the most widely used form of communications technology in human history. Four billion people in the world have mobile handsets. More people have them than don't. I'm looking forward to the number of times the word transformative will be used today. because <laughs> We can play a kind of mobile bingo uh, using that. But it, it truly is transformative. And the advent of mobile computing is revolutionary. With real high-speed mobile communications and a critical mass of devices that actually carry out that convergence stream that we've been talking about for years now, our world changes. And this change won't be merely doing what we used to faster or more conveniently. That's not it. It's not that we'll just have better phone capabilities or better auto-correction for email or that our thumbs will make fewer mistakes. No, I think that scale matters and that scale and bandwidth and computational uh, power, no other way to say it, will make for a difference in kind of communication, not just degree. And we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but we can see that this is a hockey stick moment especially once that computational power gets into devices. So they're not, we don't think of them as phones so much, but as handheld computers. And I'm deliberately using the word communication here as what human beings want to do rather than services. That's what human beings want, more advanced, more useful ways of full bandwidth communicating. And that's what high-speed mobile communications provide. Connectivity has always been valued far more than content. It's connectivity that matters to human beings. So let's remember where we are now and how could we forget. We're in a huge economic downturn. We face tremendous challenges and we have great opportunities. We need to spur short-term economic growth while simultaneously building the long-term architecture that will give us sustainable jobs, prosperity, and economic growth for many generations to come. My own view is that technology and information policy is absolutely central to that long-term architecture. At the same time, we're fixing the financial regulatory system, we're shoring up the banks, we're finding ways to help people keep their homes. We need to be making progress on our long-term innovation agenda, encouraging the development of new ideas that will produce new ways of making a living. Long-term job growth has got to be our goal, and technology and innovation policy will help us get there. And I think we can use mobile technology to innovate our way towards a better economic future. We have to be able to answer the question, what happens after stimulus? After we've made our targeted, timely, and temporary efforts to stimulate job growth in the United States, we have to have a long-term plan. We will not be done with creating jobs. We need to encourage, again, the generation of new ideas and new ways of making a living, and these jobs need to be sustainable. With mobile technology, these jobs can be mobile, productive, and sustainable. And new forms of devices can help us find new ways of making a living. There are barriers to this bright mobile future. I can think of at least three. Uh, one is the lack of reasonably priced backhaul access in this country. Fiber or microwave, backhaul access to which opportunistic mobile carriers can connect to be able to reach the internet and provide high-speed communications to their customers. 
Another is obviously the regulatory scarcity of spectrum. It feels as if it's scarce because it has been allocated and regulated in a way that makes it feel scarce. We need to find whether it might be possible to reallocate spectrum specifically for internet access uses, licensed or unlicensed. This will not happen quickly, it will happen slowly, uh, but a good first step might be to map spectrum use throughout the country and get some detailed information about exactly how it's being used and allocated. We need to continue experimentation with cognitive radio, ultra wideband, and all the other ways we can share spectrum without creating undue interference. A third barrier is location data. We need to figure out how to make geolocation data widely available so that anyone can introduce a new wireless application that brings work home. So those are three barriers I want to look into lowering. Backhaul, regulatory scarcity of spectrum, and geolocation data. And when some of those barriers come down, the converged devices will follow, and they will be great devices. I will never forget the day the iPhone first came out. I was riding on the subway in, in Manhattan, and two complete strangers felt they needed to show me their new iPhone, just so we could all share the experience. Um, Apple has now sold over 17 million iPhones, including four million in just the last quarter of last year. That kind of excitement demonstrates our desire for true, true computable computing handheld ability, beautiful interfaces, useful widgets, and the ability to get work done wherever we are. Sometime, I think about a half an hour ago, actually the billionth download of an iPhone app happened. Think about that, the billionth download. That's a lot of downloads. And we're here, of course, at lunch to celebrate that. Um, the advent of mobile high-speed internet connectivity is as fundamental as the introduction of the open PC, as the introduction of TCP IP and the internet for commercial wired use. Mobile high-speed internet connectivity, in a sense, combines all of these earlier developments. And as soon as we can figure out the power question and the non-interchangeable charger questions, we will have made a lot of progress. Uh, mobility can also advance the usefulness of government to its customers, to all of you. We can push useful information that people actually want and need, take weather, for example, uh, to their handheld devices when they've asked for it. The government creates terabytes of data every single day, and someone somewhere can make a business model out of the availability of that data. Watch for data.gov, which is going to be coming in a few months. Our uh, chief information officer, Vivek Kundra, is very focused on this, and it's extremely exciting. The idea is to make open, structured feeds of government data available online, again, so that other businesses can figure out how to use them and make useful information available to people, useful widgets. This government is able to admit that it doesn't have all the great ideas that people out in the world will be developing those great ideas. Last week, the president authorized uh, U.S. telecom carriers to operate in Cuba. This is tremendously important. It shows that the president understands that communication is central, that again, this desire for high-speed bandwidth between humans is central. The administration is dedicated to encouraging positive change in Cuba in the most basic way, by facilitating greater contact between family members through improved wireless technology. So today, for this first brief talk, I'm here to convey the deep pride that all of us in the administration feel in serving this president, and to connect that pride, for me in particular, to his authentic interest in science, technology, and innovation. And to say to you all that I think we do have a bright wireless future, technical future ahead of us, and that I personally hope we get there sooner rather than later. Thank you all very much.
we were expecting uh, Congressman Bob Goodlatte to be with us today, um, but they've stacked up, as is always my luck, uh, stacked up votes in the House. So the Congressman is not going to be able to make it over to, to provide a, a brief introduction to uh, the next co-chair of the Congressional Internet Caucus. We were delighted to see um, a couple days ago that the, co the three co-chairs of the Congressional Internet Caucus, which is about 150 so members of Congress, um, have uh, selected Senator John Thune as the next co-chair of the Congressional Internet Caucus, Republican from South Dakota. We, uh, we were thrilled to hear the announcement. Uh, Congressman uh, Senator Thune, as a congressman, um, three terms in the House of Representatives, championed legislation on uh, better e-health care, um, better e-government, uh, youth, youth online safety, um, and rural uh, broadband deployment. And as a senator, he's continued on that tradition of promoting technology and, 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 and deployment. Um, we couldn't be happier with the selection of uh, the co-chair selection of Senator Thune. He's going to be a great co-chair of the next co-chair of the Congressional Internet Caucus. So if, if I could ask you all, please congratulate and welcome uh, Senator John Thune. Well, thank you, Tim, and uh, I'm anxious to hear lessons two and three, too, so I, I really, uh, sorry to interrupt uh, what was already underway, and I appreciate the chance to be with you today, and I'm looking forward very much to working with you and your organization on issues that are of critical importance to the future of this country, and I want to congratulate uh, Bob Goodlad, who I served with in the House of Representatives for his leadership on high-tech issues for a long period of time and for working with the Internet Caucus uh, here in the Congress. Uh, Pat Leahy, Rick Boucher, also uh, people who've been involved with this for a long period of time. And so I appreciate their leadership and welcome the opportunity to work with them uh, on issues that we think are, uh, are very important to uh, the future of this country and I know are important to the people in this room. And I want to welcome you all to Washington. Um, <clears throat> we have a, some people like to call it Disneyland East, but um, any given day out here, uh, you know, there's, uh, Lots of different things going on, and I know Bob uh, got tied up with votes earlier. We've had, uh, you know, votes throughout the day as well, and and uh, legislation that we're working on in the Senate this week. So it, uh, it's a little bit unpredictable, but um, I appreciate your uh, patience with that and and your willingness to hang out with members of Congress. With our approval ratings down in the single digits, you know, it takes an act of courage to come and, and, and associate with us. And John McCain always says when you get down into the single digits, you're pretty much talking about paid staff and blood relatives. But, <laughs> but I do think that uh, there are, uh, as we all know, uh, lots, of, uh, lots of challenges, and I guess our job is to make sure that we're doing good things in terms of policies that will promote and expand and grow the economy. Uh, telecommunications and the Internet have been an incredible driver of economic growth in this country and, and are doing some wonderful things. And I would like to think I bring somewhat of a unique perspective to this because I come from the state of South Dakota where we have uh, a whole lot of uh, square miles and not many people. And um, so we are kind of what, when people, when you hear people talk about the digital divide, in many respects, South Dakota is sort of the frontier of the digital divide. And I've seen the, the remarkable things that technology can do in rural areas like South Dakota. And I can, I've also seen uh, the absence of it and uh, the impact that that can have. And as Tim mentioned, uh, when I was a member of the House of Representatives, uh, where I served for three terms, I got involved in the issue of telemedicine, and I've stayed involved with that throughout my time in the Senate. But we're doing some wonderful things through technology to deliver health care services to people in rural areas. And we think that is something that, um, that we ought to be looking at using technology to do. We have an elderly population in South Dakota. We have a, a, a very rural, a geographically isolated population. And so uh, delivering uh, health care through technology is something that uh, provides a great service to people in states like mine. When I grew up, I grew up in a small town, about uh, 600 people in the central part of South Dakota. And um, my uh, grandfather came to this country from Norway back in 1906, and he was a, uh, along with my great uncle, and they came through Ellis Island, they came to the immigration officials there. The given name wasn't Thune, it was Yelsvik. It was G-J-E-L-S-V-I-K. And the immigration officials thought that would be difficult to spell and pronounce for the people in this country, and so they asked them to change their name, and they selected the name of the farm where they worked near Bergen, Norway, which was the Thune Farm. But they, uh, they came to uh, South Dakota, work on the transcontinental railroads like a lot of people at that time did, and then settled down and started to 
uh, build and raise families and, and start businesses, got into the hardware business, which they did for a number of years. But my dad tells the stories of going through the Great Depression and how rural electrification lit up the areas of the country that didn't have access uh, even to electricity. That at that time was something that was uh, still very uncommon in rural parts of the country. And what a, what a transformational effect that had on, uh, on the country uh, where we lived at that period of time. And I recall as I was growing up in that small town of 600 people that to me the, the world sort of began and end at the city limits of my hometown of Murdo, South Dakota. And I look at now my children and the opportunities they have uh, because of technology to go to the far reaches of the world. And um, now they're a part of the Facebook and the Twitter generation. And uh, there are just so many great things that have been accomplished through the use of technology. But there are also some big challenges that we face as we move forward. And how do we deal uh, with the issues of um, making sure that broadband is accessible in very remote areas of South Dakota, another area that uh, could benefit immensely from the use of high-speed uh, Internet technologies is the Indian reservations in South Dakota. We've got uh, people who live in poverty and um, some very uh, just awful economic conditions and those are very isolated, geographically isolated areas in our state. And that, that too is something that when we talk about delivery of uh, high-speed internet broadband services, there are lots of places in South Dakota that just flat don't have access to it yet. And so what are the best incentives to encourage uh, development, investment in those areas of the country to make sure that everybody across the country is, is, uh, is wired up? And, um, and also, I know the purpose of this is to talk about the mobile net in the future and where that goes. And I think that, too, is, uh, is uh, something that uh, as we focus on the future of, of uh, this industry and where it's headed, uh, draw on the lessons from the past, but look with anticipation to the many, hopefully, remarkable developments going forward, bearing in mind at the same time we've got to be conscious of issues like privacy and how do we continue to use uh, advertising online as a great way to, um, to provide free internet services, but also to make sure that people's uh, personal privacy is protected. Uh, the issue of cybersecurity is something, too, that uh, continues to, to loom out there. And, you know, there are lots of uh, folks who are always trying to hack into our systems in this country. And so we've got uh, lots of issues to, uh, to focus on, and I hope that uh, this conference will um, but be meaningful to all of you is, uh, and, and as we consult with you about the future, the direction, the policies that we put in place that encourage uh, the further development of, um, of technology and telecommunication services in this country, uh, we look forward to working with you and, um, and answering some of those hard questions. But we think that uh, the sky's the limit in this country. It's difficult to, to predict the future. Um, <laughs> Yogi Berra once said, predictions are difficult, especially about the future. And, uh, and I think that's uh, certainly something that um, we can all appreciate. But if you look back on just in the short time that I've been around here and where I started from in that little town in South Dakota and how far we have come and the discussions and the conversations that we're having today and the way that we're using the power of technology, um, it's, uh, I think the sky is the limit. So we look forward to working with you. I thank you for the opportunity to stop by and say hi today. And uh, as we... Um, as you continue with this conference today, I'm anxious to get a download from you. I want to congratulate you on the work that you do. I know the Internet uh, Advisory Committee has played an important role in advising Congress in conducting conferences like this where you do talk about and elevate some of these important issues. And, and uh, we certainly uh, welcome the input and the advice that, uh, that you all give us as we try and shape policies that will promote a, a, a stronger, uh, more prosperous American economy and, uh, and hopefully a, a more prosperous world. So thank you all very much. Uh, have a great conference, and I appreciate the chance to stop by today. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you, Brendan, his staff, Brendan Plack over there. We really appreciate it. Looking forward to um, your leadership and, and, and going forward in the future.